joining us tonight. My name is Kristen Kovach Bentley. I'm the communications manager for the Retired Resource Project and um, steer our annual webinar series. So we're really excited to bring back a hoof care webinar because it's been a long time since we've had one. Um, part of the RRP's mission, of course, is educating more thoroughbred owners and the people who transition them to um, make everybody a little bit more of an empowered horse owner uh, and make good decisions. So to that end, we're really excited tonight to have with us Alicia Harloff from the Humble Hoof. Um, Alicia is a full-time hoof care provider servicing the North Shore of Massachusetts and surrounding areas. She's the creator of the Humble Hoof podcast and operates the Humble Hoof Rehab Facility in Amesbury, Mass. She loves educating horse owners on how to grow the healthiest hoof possible and believes that getting a horse sound is often a matter of finding the right pieces to the puzzle. She's on a never ending journey to find as many tools to help as she can. So we're very excited to have her with us tonight to help us all grow a healthier thoroughbred foot. So I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. This is where like you think I know how to do this by now, right? So let's see, can this work? Can everybody see that? Yeah, that looks good. All right, perfect. So obviously today we're going to talk about developing healthy off the track thoroughbred hooves. And I know that some of you who are on here have been a part of other webinars I've done. And um, this information isn't going to be like crazy new. A lot of it, some of you might have heard before, but um, almost every image that you see in this webinar is an off the track thoroughbred hoof. So I will point out the few of them that are not thoroughbred feet, but most of these images are directly from either hoofs, hooves that are on my books or ones of other hoof care providers that I asked to, um, to submit some pictures for me to use. So it'll be interesting to see some examples that might break some of the stereotypes that are so, so prevalent surrounding <laughs> thoroughbred feet. So first, why does it matter to grow a healthy foot? I know that uh, many of you already know this, but no hoof, no horse. Um, the earlier we catch potential issues in the hoof, the more likely we are to prevent hoof-based lameness or, or straight out career ending injuries. I mean, there's a lot of differences between um, uh, balance and in different barriers working on hooves. And there are some things that can, can lead to repetitive strain type injuries that can, can cause career ending problems. Um, and also, if we're caring for horses, it's our job to be their advocate and to watch out for their welfare. So obviously, you know, I think most of you on here have familiarity with thoroughbreds and have heard a lot of the thoroughbred hoof myths. Um, things like, oh, they just have terrible feet or terrible thoroughbred feet, or they can't be barefoot, or, oh, it's a thoroughbred. Obviously, they have thin soles or like, oh, their feet are chipping because they're thoroughbred feet. Um, and then, you know, the stereotype of thoroughbreds have long toe, low heel conformation, um, or, you know, high low is another one. And there's, there's so many of these that are, are commonly laughed off as an excuse as to why a thoroughbred has, you know, poor feet or soundness issues. But I kind of want to shake the cage a little bit and see, are these really true? So first, before we get into thoroughbred feet, I want to talk about, you know, what factors affect healthy hooves. Um, so this is actually a page from a, a journal, um, my journal called the Humble Hoof Rehab Guide. And I included it because uh, I don't know how aware horse owners are as to how many things can affect soundness and hoof health. Um, so everything from their diet, you know, nutrients, vitamins, minerals, um, you know, their movement, their stress in their life illness, um, their metabolic status, uh, their dental health and their dental balance in their mouth, um, rider balance, saddle fit, their hoof care, all of this can affect how, how they move, how their hooves wear, um, how strong their feet are. Um, so note that out of this list, I don't typically add genetics. So I'm not going to be one of those people that ascribe uh, thoroughbred hoof quality to their genetics um, necessarily. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, there's a lot of other things on this list that I would go through first before just blaming their breed. So again, you know, don't use off the track thoroughbred feet as an excuse, because if we do just blame genetics, we may miss some pretty serious issues. Um, for horses, uh, 
feet are like the canary in the coal mine. That was a, a quote that I first heard from a, a great hoof care provider named Pete Ramey. And what that means is that the hooves give you a warning sign to internal issues. So, um, you know, sometimes long before we see outward pathology or disease, the hooves are giving us kind of a, a barometer to what's going on inside the horse. So hoof sensitivity can be a warning sign to something more serious. Um, and I will say that, that even thin soles and weak feet are also a warning sign. So some people say, oh, my, my horse is just sore because they have thin soles. Well, I wanna know why they have thin soles and I don't wanna just blame genetics. Um, you know, I, if we just blame genetics in these cases, we could miss some pretty serious issues like PPID, which is Cushing's, or laminitic issues, or even just dietary imbalances, wh whereas when those are managed, we could end up having a much more comfortable sound horse with much stronger feet. So what are thoroughbreds known, why are thoroughbreds known for having bad feet? Um, you know, I just mentioned a little bit about this. Why do they get a bad rap? Uh, well, some people will ultimately blame genetics. And I, I personally have seen genetics play maybe a, a small role, uh, small enough that by changing some of the things that we're going to talk about in this webinar, um, I've actually seen, you know, poor off the track thoroughbred feet turn into strong hooves. So that being said, I do think that Horses like thoroughbreds do maybe genetically have thinner walls than say a large draft horse or a cob, um, similar to how, you know, I see ponies grow hair like yaks, whereas a saddle horse might not get as thick of a coat in the winter. So is there a difference between breeds for things like feet and coat? Sure, maybe. But does that mean that thoroughbreds can't have strong feet because of their breed? I will resoundingly say no. Um, so what else can contribute to this stereotype? Well, many complain about the way that thoroughbreds are trimmed um, for a reason. And, and while I will admit that, you know, I don't love that thoroughbreds on, on the track often appear to have longer toes and lower heels. Um, I, I actually went to a clinic last weekend and um, it was with Pat Riley. And he was talking about thoroughbred feet and the long toe, low heel issues. And I now think that maybe that this actually could be a good thing, oddly enough, that they're trimmed this way. Um, we know that from, for while they're racing, um, we know that from Dr. Renata Weller, uh, that a longer toe puts more stress on the deep digital flexor tendon. And that has been linked to a lot of issues like navicular diagnosis, DDFT tears and injuries. Um, but other research has shown that there's really no zero sum in hoof care. So basically anything you do to a foot is going to affect something. So a shorter toe may be beneficial to the DDFT, but it can actually, if you, as you bring the break over back, it can actually cause more instability and issues with the suspensory ligaments. So uh, one of the most common career ending and life ending injuries in racehorses is catastrophic suspensory failure. So it's possible that having a longer toe in racing actually saves uh, some percentage of these racing thoroughbreds from having a catastrophic suspensory injury while racing. And that was something that Pat Riley talked about at this clinic. Um, of course, there isn't any study into this, and we can't see this for sure, but it was something that got me thinking that you know, is it so bad that for this career, they have longer toes, lower heels? Maybe not. Maybe it is. <laughs> Maybe it's terrible for their DDFTs. Um, but at speed, it might actually be saving their suspensories. So there, this can be setting them up for, you know, needing to be rehabbed later, needing their hooves to be rehabbed later. But maybe for that time period, it's actually, you know, has a, has a purpose. Um, so another issue that might be leading to bad feet on thoroughbreds is their management while they're on the track. Um, I do think that racehorses that are kept inside and only brought out to breeze or race, um, especially in open heeled shoes, they can have a lack of stimulation to the caudal hoof that can lead to weaker internal structures like the digital cushion in that back half of the hoof. Um, I've seen plenty of thoroughbreds that did not go into racing for a variety of reasons were turned out as normal horses and their hooves are strong and capable. They have a much different hoof than a racehorse because from birth they were out moving in a herd, out with others, um, and they were able to develop that foot from a young age. So again, 
another reason why I don't necessarily blame thoroughbred feed on genetics. Um, and then of course there are horses that after their racing career has ended, they're then kept as if they're still racehorses. So what do I mean by that? Um, you know, racehorses are fed high starch, um, you know, high, often high sugar diets because they're utilizing those carbs while they're racing, they're working really hard. Um, and you know, once they get off the track, a lot of people are like, oh, well, I have a thoroughbred and, and they are hard keepers. They need a lot of calories. And as they're adjusting into a less demanding lifestyle, they end up still keeping them on a diet that might not be necessary. And, you know, this, they, they are treated as if they're hard keepers they are treated as if they have weak feet without giving them a chance to grow stronger feet. And I think that this can end up perpetuating hoof issues because of the stereotypes we're actually perpetuating their, their own issues because we're kind of feeding into them a little bit. So before we talk about rehabbing thoroughbred feet, maybe we should talk about what defines a hoof as healthy. Um, so my favorite way to define a hoof as healthy is functionality. So can the feet do what the owner is asking of them? Can they move comfortably over various terrain? And I want to check hoof comfort levels without any hoof protection because, so we know that we're not masking any symptoms just to get a true assessment. Um, obviously, you know, there are a variety of reasons why you might use hoof protection. And the reason that I want to assess without it is because a horse can be actually overtly laminitic. And once you put uh, a shoe package or, or therapeutic boots, boots on their feet, they can move soundly. So we wouldn't say that that horse has healthy feet if it's laminitic, but it's comfortable um, with protection. So I wanna see what the horse is feeling when it's, when it's barefoot to know how strong those hooves are. Obviously there's other ways to define a healthy hoof. Functionality is my number one because I care more about that than appearances for most of the time. But we want to know what, what is our kind of baseline for, for telling how a hoof is healthy from appearances too. So when we pick up the foot, the first thing I consider is the frog. So um, you know, a weak frog can actually make for a really sore horse. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but a lot of times when I've seen a, a horse that has sensitivity over various terrain, you look at their frog and they have just a thrush eaten, really weak atrophied frog. And once that gets stronger, they're much more comfortable. So I want the frog to be the texture of a firm rubber eraser when palpated. I want it to be wide and open. Um, I've heard various things about what the correct width of the frog should be. Uh, typically, I want it to be, I want the widest part of the frog to be about two thirds of the width of the widest part of the foot. Um, and I want the middle of the back of the frog called the central sulcus. I want that to be open and no deeper than a thumbprint. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I want this area to be open, no deeper than a thumbprint. I don't want like a split there. I don't want to be able to fit a hoof pick in there. Um, those are all indicative of issues. Also, when I'm looking at the foot, um, I don't want the white line or the connection between the sole and the wall to have any separation. So I don't want to be able to fit a hoof pick in between these areas too. Actually, this hoof right here has some separation. Um, and I want the walls to be fairly thick and strong. Um, on a darker hoof, you might see this white inner hoof wall and then a, a darker outer hoof wall or a black hoof wall. And each of these, you know, could be a few millimeters thick. And like I said earlier, on a thoroughbred, these walls might be thinner, but um, it doesn't mean that they're not strong. So the collateral groove next to the frog um, should create a sort of a valley that's around, you know, maybe an inch deep at the deepest part. And a lot of people will say that the sole should be concave, which, which is true. Concavity is a good thing for the most part. Um, but a horse that lives on firm or flat ground will often have a flatter foot and a hoof that has a, a conformationally flat coffin bone will actually have a flatter foot appearance just because they're, the sole follows the coffin bone and you can't get a super concave foot if you have a flat coffin bone. So I don't necessarily gauge the health of the foot just by the, the concavity. So looking at the side of the foot um, or the lateral view, we can call this. First, 
I think about the hoof balance from front to back or dorsal palmar balance. And typically, you know, for the most part, I want the foot balanced around the center of rotation. So the center of rotation is basically the center of the coffin joint or the joint between this short pastern bone and the coffin bone. And the hoof will rotate around this joint in movement. So ideally, you know, in a perfect world, textbook world, you pe people say that we want 50% of the hoof in front of that center of rotation and 50% of the hoof behind that center of rotation. Um, you can kind of guesstimate where that joint center of rotation is by tracing a line over this hairline or the coronary band and dividing it into thirds and then drawing a line straight down from that first third. Oh, let me go back. Sorry, I clicked on my mouse there. <laughs> drawing a line straight down from that first third and and that should be right around where the center of rotation is um and you know you like we can look at this foot it's just about maybe a little bit more than 50 percent in front um but it's pretty close when we're looking at this side view i also want the hoof wall tubules so these little it's hard to see on this picture but there's you can see in person usually these little lines of the wall growing in and I want those to be fairly straight. I want the wall to be fairly smooth without ridges or event lines or bruising or cracks. And the hairline should be fairly relaxed. You don't want it to be like, I have a super big arch here or a curve or dip down or curl under at the heel or anything like that. Um, and then the angle of the heel and the angle of the dorsal wall or the front should be fairly equal. So we don't want this heel like having a really, really shallow angle, kind of almost parallel with the ground, and then the angle at the toe to be really upright. You want them to be fairly e equal. And, you know, one thing, you know, a lot of people will talk about alignment. So basically when you're looking at this fetlock and drawing a straight line down and say like, oh, we want, if we put a dot in the middle of this fetlock, we want to be able to draw a line straight down through the pastern through the hoof, and it should be really a straight alignment. Um, I personally don't focus on this as much, uh, which might surprise some people. Um, but some horses that I see that are sound have a less than ideal alignment and they can become crippled when you force them to have a, you know, a quote unquote ideal alignment. Um, obviously th these cases might be a little bit more rare, but I see it enough in rehab cases where I'm more willing to allow a horse to have whatever comfortable balance they need in those joints because a lot of times there can be some calcification in the joints or there can be some old ligament or tendon issues that just don't appreciate forcing them into that perfect alignment. And from the front, this is called the dorsal view. Um, we're going to consider a lot of the same kind of characteristics as that lateral view we just looked at. We want a relaxed hairline. <laughs> it's kind of hard to see on this hoof. Um, so actually the last three hooves we looked at were not thoroughbred feet. I meant to say that. Um, so this one is a Frisian cross. And so he has a, a bit of feathering. Um, but you know, we don't want event lines. We don't want cracks in the hooves. Um, and if we drew a line down the cannon bone, which we can't even see in this picture, if we drew it down, you want that foot to be uh, right about under that leg. You know, we want it kind of balanced under the center of mass. And we don't want to see a ton of flaring on the foot, which is when a foot kind of looks like a bell where the, the sides of the hoof wall maybe come out farther than at the top. There should be a reasonable little bit of widening down the foot, but we don't want it to be severely flared. All right, so how do we grow healthier thoroughbred feet? If we, we kind of know what parameters we're looking for, how do we get our, our thoroughbreds there, especially if we get them and their feet are, are not serving them well? Um, well, it might sound crazy, but a huge portion of the horses I see with hoof issues, they become exponentially more comfortable when we address dietary triggers for their hoof problems. And I will say that all the images from here on out, I'm pretty sure now I'm second guessing myself, but I'm pretty sure that all the images from here on out are thoroughbred feet. So this one is a, a thoroughbred rehab that I did. Um, so 
one of my favorite quotes, and I've, I've quoted this in past webinars, so I'm, I apologize that some of you on here probably heard me say this before, um, but Dr. Thomas Teske says, the healthiest hooves are attached to the healthiest animals. And I've, tried, I've found that to be true time and again when it comes to a proper diet. So when a horse is getting all the nutrients it needs, all the vitamins and minerals it needs, then their lamina connection, wall quality, soul depth, frog health, they all grow in so much healthier and can function at its healthiest. Because we're, we're giving the hoof, we're giving the horse what it needs and we're giving the hoof what it needs. And while something like the quality of the wall, um, you know, might seem like it's it's genetics based, like we were saying earlier. Um, I find that that feeding a horse the way that it should eat, um, I can see a horse that has poor hoof quality grow in a much healthier and even a little bit thicker wall. Um, and you know, then we can get away from just blaming that genetics of thoroughbred feed. So many people feed a, a high starch and sugar feed because of, they consider thoroughbreds to be hard keepers. They need, you know, this higher starch to keep on weight. Um, and honestly, the truth is most of my thoroughbred clients actually become the easiest keepers on my books once they're getting enough forage and they have less stress. Um, you know, they're, they're maybe, you know, out in a herd, out with others, able to move around, have access to forage all the time, um, reducing the risk of ulcers and other health problems that can lead to weight issues. I see them need less and less of that high starch, high sugar grain and thrive on forage when we're able to kind of balance their minerals and make sure they're getting what they're needing in other ways. So we can talk a little bit about mineral balancing because the best way to ensure that the hooves are getting what they need is to test our hay and know what is in the hay and supplement with what it's missing so that we can address any kind of deficiencies. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about diet in terms of forage first, then uh, Dr. Kathleen Gustafson has a, a database of, of hundreds and hundreds of hay tests from around the country. And she found that 90, upwards of 95% of hay is deficient in copper and zinc, enough so that even most grain rations don't supplement enough to meet the NRC requirements to survive, for a horse to survive, let alone thrive and grow a healthy hoof horn. Uh, but it gets worse because when we consider that every single mineral that we're intaking or, or feeding our horses uh, has to kind of balance each other and work in ratio with each other, um, minerals in excess, like iron and manganese, can actually offset a typical mineral deficiency and make it more, um, more serious by the fact that it becomes a relative deficiency. So instead of just being like, oh, we're not feeding enough copper and zinc, so it's not even meeting the daily requirements. Then suddenly if they're getting a ton of iron and manganese just from their natural forage or their water, all of a sudden that disparity of copper and zinc actually feels bigger and bigger and bigger. Like they're getting less and less copper and zinc because it's, it's losing the battle of, of being absorbed in the horse's body because all the iron and manganese, manganese is taken up in those receptors. So how, if, if we're not even meeting the daily requirements for the horse to survive, how are we going to give them enough to grow a healthy hoof? Um, and this horse right here, this was just, I would say about three or four months after transitioning from um, a high starch grain. And he actually, he stayed on grain. He switched to a lower starch grain. It was um, Triple Crown Senior. He switched to, I don't remember what he was on. And this, this new growth up here, so this top part of the foot, is just a few months on that, that lower starch grain and on a copper and zinc supplement that had amino acids and vitamin E and things like that to make sure that the horse was getting those minor minerals. Um, and just this tighter hoof growing in eventually grew all the way down to the ground. But you can see down here, these event lines, this flaring, that wasn't his genetics. It was that his diet was causing these chronic insults of inflammation um, that just weren't serving his hooves well. 
and honestly, I should say that um, I have done an, almost an entire webinar just on diet. So if you're like, oh my goodness, I, I'm so confused about diet, I want to learn more about it. Um, I did a webinar with Wendy Murdoch called The Owner's Role and Hoof Rehabilitation, and I spent about 45 minutes on diet. So <laughs> I know we can't really dig that deep into it today, but um, if you really want to kind of dive into that more, that's on YouTube. So there's kind of been a lot of debate about mineral balancing recently, especially there's been various, you know, PhDs and, and people saying that um, it's not necessary and that uh, issues like high iron aren't really a problem or that it's not really absorbed. Um, we know from the NRC, the, uh, the um, National Research Council, that, that there is something in a horse's body that regulates iron uptake. It's called hepcidin. But when it's overwhelmed, um, which Dr. Gustafson's database found that that there was zero uh, percent of hay that was deficient in iron. So all of it is providing either enough iron or too much iron. Um, that when hepcidin is overwhelmed, it can no longer control or uh, properly manage the overwhelming amount of iron in the body, um, which seems like it would be pretty common considering that iron is, is, is prevalent in forage. Um, so there's, you know, a whole group of people that say that maybe mineral balancing isn't really important. Um, I will say as a hoof care provider, seeing hundreds of horses a month that I see a marked improvement from mineral balancing and it's inexpensive. It's fairly easy to do. And even if you can't test your hay, um, you can kind of do a stop gap of of so many different options to make sure that your horse is getting the minerals it needs to grow a healthier foot. So um, this horse right here in this picture is uh, was a four-year-old off the track thoroughbred. I met him in February of 2021 and he had such thin soles and weak feet and was sore and couldn't walk over gravel, was just uncomfortable. Um, and just within, what is this, five months, four months? February, March, April, May. Yeah. So, so five months, he had such healthier hooves, was so much more comfortable. He was actually trail riding out over gravel barefoot, um, four-year-old off the track thoroughbred. And a lot of this was the owner, uh, reduced his grain, put him on a lower starch grain and supplemented with, um, a supplement called Vermont blend. It has good levels of copper and zinc. I'm not sponsored by them. <laughs> I feed it myself to my horses, but, um, I don't, I don't make money from this. Um, there's also other great options like California trace plus, um, horse tech has a lot of regional blends that are really good. Mad barn has a lot of regional blends that are really good. And anecdotally as a hoof care provider, I've seen time and again, hooves that respond in this way to good mineral balancing, um, a tighter lamina connection, um, hoof comfort, more comfort over various surfaces. Um, a healthier frog, healthier soul depth. So it's just something where obviously it takes time, it, you know, can take uh, six to eight months to see that new hoof hit the ground, but the reward is just amazing to see these healthier feet. Um, there, there was one study when I was kind of doing some research uh, a few years ago on, is there any studies for copper and zinc? And there's not really any great study of whether copper and zinc um, is proven to grow a healthier foot other than these anecdotal examples, except that in 1999, there was a study um, that actually Dr. Chris Pollitt talked about in 2005 and found that horses that were on a higher copper and zinc diet had a lower susceptibility or could have, it seemed they wanted further research, but could have a, a lower susceptibility to white line disease and poor wall quality. So I do wonder when I see thoroughbreds that um, have poor hooves, how much of that is just that they just need a copper and zinc boost. And a lot of times I see that working out for them pretty well, like this guy. So oddly enough, these images are from the same horse in the last slide, um, just because he was a great example of once he was more comfortable over various terrain, his owner was able to ride him all over and his feet just developed really well. So this was um, the same foot in these radiographs. 
Uh, he started with a negative palm, or sorry, negative plantar angle, a hind foot, um, just under, uh, just about zero, uh, negative 0.21 degrees. So just under uh, ground parallel. And this sole depth of just under a centimeter, what I think is a little bit um, generous because these arrows, I kind of chose a lower part of this sole. If we're really looking at the distance under the coffin bone to this area of retracted sole. I would say it was even less than that. And again, just in a few months, he then had a positive plantar angle. And old, I would say he about doubled his sole depth if we're actually going by his, his thinner area there. So um, I'd say that the most important thing, and I know that we just talked about diet, so maybe I should put movement first, but the most important thing I look for to increase hoof health and comfort is, is actually movement, even over diet. Um, I've seen horses, even ones with less than ideal management in the diet area, um, have incredible gains in hoof health, simply from increasing their turnout time, increasing their movement, especially movement over varied terrain. So if we're getting these hooves to, um, interact with a lot of different kinds of surfaces, then the foot is a neurosensory organ. It's going to respond to everything it comes in contact with. So when I was thinking about ways to grow a healthier hoof for this webinar, I immediately thought about um, Dr. Andrew Van Epps. I saw him at the 2019 NAEP symposium, and he is amazing. He actually is one of the leading researchers into laminitis. But he actually did a handful of studies on load cycling and his focus was on supporting limb laminitis cases. You know, if a horse has a broken leg and they get laminitis in the, the opposite leg, I think some of you have heard of, of um, cases like that and why this happens. He's trying to figure out why this happens. And he found that load cycling, so basically weighting and off weighting the foot, so picking it up and putting it down, increases circulation or perfusion in the hoof capsule. And this is important because if a horse has an injury, like we we're just talking about supporting limb laminitis and they have an injured leg and they're unwilling to pick up the opposing leg, that means that that leg has significant decrease in circulation. So obviously this webinar is not about laminitis, but basically a horse that's standing around all the time and not moving is not getting the same circulation of a horse that is moving and in turnout and, and playing with friends and things like that. Um, so Dr. Van Epps uh, showed slides visualizing how um, filled the capillaries were when the foot was loaded and then unloaded and, and then walking. So his, his conclusion was that supporting limb laminitis was actually due to ischemia or lack of blood flow in the foot when bearing weight on it without rest. So um, you know, again, that's not the point of this webinar, but I, I might be making a leap here. But this makes sense that with consistent movement, we are ideally helping with consistent, healthy circulation in the foot. And we see a lot of issues in the medical field from lack of blood to the tissues. I mean, blood is what, what heals, you know, red blood cells are what heal things, right? Um, so I can only imagine that this movement and, and increase in circulation will benefit the internal structures of the hoof or, you know, at least prevent supporting limb laminitis in a severely injured horse. So, you know, I am making a leap there, but I wouldn't think that anybody would disagree that movement is a bad thing. Uh, so coming up from another side of distal limb health, um, Dr. Lauren Schnabel, she is a very prominent um, veterinarian who researches soft tissue injuries and rehab. Um, she found that controlled movement actually strengthens soft tissue and it's very important to soft tissue healing and in injury cases and she found that challenging this tissue through movement is what strengthens it prevents adhesions and prevents fibrosis so she found that movement is critical in having healthy strong structures and again i don't think that anyone's going to argue that like if you're comparing two people and one person sits at a desk all day and you know how strong are they compared to someone who's out with a very physical job or somebody who's out consistently working out at the gym all day? Like again, this is a neurosensory organ with tissues inside that are going to respond to movement and work. So one more example about movement, um, or actually two more, but but one more I want to talk a little bit about is uh, 
Dr. Martina Neidhart, um, she referenced this in a webinar she did in March, 2021. And she quoted a study from, from a long time ago, from 1987. So what is that, like 36 years ago? Um, on immobilization of horse's joints. And it showed an effect on the ligaments, collagen, and connective tissue within 48 hours. So basically, if a horse is on stall rest and, and not moving, within 48 hours, there was an, there started to be some degradation of that lig those ligaments, collagen, and connective tissue. Um, so this is something that has been, the idea of movement and lack of movement causing issues has been around for quite some time. If people really want to look more into movement and how that can improve hooves, I would recommend looking into um, Dr. Deborah Taylor has a, a free webinar. It's online or I mean, it was free last time I checked um, called Is the Hoof Smart? Last I checked, you could find it on the horse.com. I'm not sure if it's still there. I probably should have checked before I did this webinar, but um, the last time I, I watched it, it was still on the horse.com. And she noted the changes, or in this webinar, she notes the changes in the hoof capsule over time with movement. Um, it's definitely worth a watch. So we're talking about movement. So, um, you know, turnout doesn't necessarily mean movement. And I don't want to be controversial about that. But again, as a hoof care provider, I go to a lot of different barns. Um, I, I see all different kinds of setups. And I will say that, especially being in Massachusetts, a very common barn to come to is to show up with a horse in an individual turnout where their hay is in, you know, a, a, a hay box or on the ground or in a, even in a slow feed net about 10 feet from their water. And I would see those horses standing at their hay net and then turning their head and maybe taking two steps and taking a drink of water and then turning their head and taking two steps and going back to their hay. And I would venture a guess that that is the majority of their day if they're an individual turnout. Um, so just because they're getting turned out, I mean, I think that's turnout is so important for their mental health and um, being able to see others and things like that and, and be out with others is, is even better. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean, mean that they're moving. So one thing that um, is a practical way to help horses to move more is to separate their resources. So put their hay as far from their water as possible. Or if you have, you know, if that's too much work to make sure that those resources are separated, like you don't want to walk all the way across the paddock to drop their hay as far from the water as possible, then put their hay next to their water and put a barrier so they cannot go directly between the two. So I have at my farm a track system as part of my rehab program. Um, I do have the water and hay as far apart as possible, but I have seen tracks where the water and hay are next to each other, but the horse has to walk around a giant U to get from, like the letter U, to get from the water to their hay, and it increases their movement by miles a day. Um, again, this, this hoof right here uh, is not an off the track thoroughbred. This is actually an appendix quarter horse, but he was 75% thoroughbred or is 75% thoroughbred. I still work on his feet. And when I met him, I pulled him out of shoes. He had this really awful central sulcus infection. Um, and just, he had actually previously foundered, um, just very weak, sensitive, um, painful feet and very contracted heels. These heel bulbs were very pinched together. And he was living at a barn where he lived out 24 seven. He had, he was outside 24 seven and, you know, on a good diet, he was getting good minerals. He was on a forage based diet. He actually wasn't even getting grain. Um, obviously as a previously foundered horse, that was important for him. And his feet still didn't progress from this to this until he moved to a different barn and was out with a friend and started moving around a lot more and moving to different resources and his hay was separated from his water. And I mean, I trimmed him for two years when this, well, not, I, this was one of my first trims on him, but I trimmed him for two years and his feet did not progress much from this. Once he moved to that other barn and was moving more, his hooves just decontracted, his frog uh, thrush, his central sulcus cleared up um, and his foot just totally changed. And now he can walk over any surface comfortably, even as a 
past founder case. He actually found her twice before his owner, you know, got him rehabbed him. Um, and he now can handle walking over rocks, any kind of surface comfortably. So one thing that's really important to note though, is that you should not force movement if the horse is sore or lame. So if your horse is not comfortable on gravel, forcing them to walk over gravel will not necessarily make them comfortable on gravel. I not one of those like zealots who's like, oh my goodness, we need to like build up a callus on the bottom of a horse's foot. Compensatory movement will cause more issues in the body than making sure the horse's feet are comfortable in order to move. So don't force your horse to move if it's sore or lame, make sure that they're comfortable. So we wanna talk about what comfortable movement is. Like I said, movement isn't bad, but improper movement is bad. That's the first line on this. Um, so what is healthy movement? Well, at the most, most basic level, a horse's caudal hoof, so the back half of their foot, the frog and digital cushion, is so important as the shock absorbing structures for the horse, for the, the ground reaction forces that, from them walking and moving around. So a healthy hoof, moving with purpose, should land primarily heel first. And I know that we have access to so many new gait analysis software and so much amazing technology that's showing the little minute areas where a hoof might land and load and how to tell um, landing versus peak load versus breakover. And those are so amazing. But what I'm talking about is if you have a phone and you're recording a horse from the lateral view like these images are showing and you're recording it in slow motion, what does it appear to be doing? Um, obviously that software can tell us a lot more, but this is just for if everyone who has a phone can access this information at home without needing um, really expensive software. So this is just kind of how to assess that. So like I said, a healthy horse, I'm oh, sorry, a healthy hoof should land primarily heel first. So this will allow the horse to utilize that frog and digital cushion for a shock absorber as part of the landing process. And it'll allow the foot to distribute the shock as the horse moves and loads its foot. So the, the hoof is the first, you know, obviously the hoof is the first point of contact for ground reaction forces. And the hoof is how those ground reaction forces are distributed through soft tissue, through joints and up the limb. So a horse that is landing like this horse on this left picture, where the toe is the first point of contact, that means that the deep digital flexor tendon is not extended as it should be. The carpus is not extended as it should be. All these joints are, are in flexion. There, there is actually less ability for this horse to absorb those reaction forces properly when they're landing this way. And it can lead to potential of repetitive strain type injuries to the ligaments, um, to the tendons, can lead to atrophy of the hoof in the back half of the foot, um, a lot of knock-on problems. So those proper landings can actually, you know, obviously, like we said, help distribute shock, but also help for allowing good circulation, like we're talking about load cycling with Dr. Van Epps, allow for good hoof growth, and also can help develop the back half of the foot. So help develop the frog and develop the digital cushion so that it can help support the back of the coffin bone and help with a healthier palmar angle or healthier alignment like we we're talking about earlier. And I hear a lot of complaints about thoroughbreds having low palmar or plantar angles or broken back alignment. And if we can bulk up the frog and bulk up the digital cushion, through good movement, you're going to have a healthier and better supported back half of the foot and better supported coffin bone. So you will actually solve some of those issues that we see in thoroughbreds simply by getting a healthier back half of the foot. So one thing I should say um, is that a horse that doesn't have good frog support through either you know, movement barefoot or movement with packing um, or support, like a frog support pad or something like that over the frog can actually end up with caudal failure and atrophy, even if they have quote unquote good movement. So if they have you know, an op a traditional um, 
set up open heel shoes and they might be landing heel first. If all that compression is coming down with the, their body weight, they can actually, you can actually end up seeing a weaker heel over time. Um, I see that more with horses that have weak hooves to begin with, and you just see them deteriorate this way. Um, but I do think that, that allowing that support over the frog can be incredibly important when rehabbing these horses with caudal if issues. So this is an example of an off the track thoroughbred who is at my farm for rehab. Um, she's actually here for rehab for, for a navicular diagnosis, but she does have calcified deep digital flexor tendon and calcified collateral ligaments. Um, and was just very sore when she came. Um, the thing that's frustrating about these images is the top photos were taken from a phone that was over three years old. <laughs> and then the, or sorry, the top video. And the bottom video was taken with a brand new phone. So it's, you can tell that the top images are a little bit fuzzy and I could not clear them up any more than they are. Um, but when she came just last month, she was landing toe first and it's hard to see in this image over here, but she was landing harder on the lateral or outside of her hoof. So toe first laterally. And you can tell that um, her, her leg is actually, looks like it's almost turning in a bit. That's just how she was landing on that foot. And her, it was her left front that was a big issue, but also her right hind, which is, is common. Diagonal compensation is very common. So she was landing toe first on the right hind as well. Um, so we tweaked her diet a bit. Um, we got her moving 24 seven out with friends on the track system over varied terrain. And within one month, she is now landing heel first, um, she is landing a stronger heel first on her front than this hind. I do think that she has some issues higher up on this hind um, that's that need to be worked out a bit, but she is landing much more flat on this hind at least and much more balanced up front. Instead of having this leg come way in towards her center of mass, she's willing to extend it a bit more and have it a, a bit more laterally and, and balanced under her. And again, this is one month difference. We're gonna talk a little bit about timeline, but I will say this is, is not normal. Don't expect that, you know, if you're, you're like, okay, I'm gonna rehab my thoroughbred's feet and it's gonna take a month. Um, this owner had been trying to rehab her for a very lo long time. And she sent her to me sort of as a last resort to see what we can get done here. Um, and this, is, this even surprised me on how quickly she has improved. So one thing that I will say is when it comes to timeline and growing in healthier hooves, because we're going to talk about timeline in a minute, that I care more about the horse's comfort than I do about how their hooves look. Because I can post, and we'll see before and after pictures um, it, for the next bunch of slides, and I can post before and after pictures all day long of hooves looking ugly and then looking pretty. But if that horse is dead lame when that hoof is pretty, I don't really care what it looks like. If that hoof is not serving that horse well. So I want that horse to be moving comfortably more than I want the foot to look perfect. So this is the same horse, the one that's at my property. We just saw the still shots from the movement video. Um, so the timeline is different for every horse, but typically like we talked about with diet, a new hoof capsule will take about seven to nine months to grow down. And I will say that with more movement, I have seen hooves grow in much quicker, like five to six months to grow a whole new hoof. Because, and I think that it might go back to what Dr. Andrew Van Epps talked about, where there's better circulation with movement and load cycling, and that better circulation might just be growing the hoof in faster. Um, so the more positive factors that we have on board, like a good diet and good movement and um, a forage-based diet, mineral balance, things like that, the faster you typically see results in a timeline. But we can't ever guarantee how long it might take for hooves to get healthier. Sometimes it takes a month, like this, this image here where, you know, she was incredibly broken back. She had a very weak back half of her foot, long toe. She actually had a bull nose here from her low palmar angle. And now we're seeing that she's getting much more aligned. I did not just chop her toes off. It was not just the trim. 
Um, in fact, I left, I have purposely left her with a little bit of a longer toe because she is significantly more comfortable that way. But just from her movement on the track, she's gotten more comfortable. Um, and this is, again, like I said, it surprised me that it's only taken her a month, but I've seen horses where it's taken two full new hoof capsules to grow in. So 18 months or two years until you're like, oh, wow, these feet are healthy. I can't actually, I, I'm surprised. Like it, it's almost sneaks up on you. The fact that you get, you take for granted that they have weak feet all the time. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, they're actually much better now that they've been on a good diet for two years. <laughs> so I can't guarantee that your horse is going to be, you know, fall into this perfect timeline or, or be better really quickly. It really depends on the horse. So one thing that I find really important with thoroughbreds is listening to the horse when it comes to adjustments and changes. So like I said, with that mare in the last slide, I tried when she first came just to take her toe off and she was very unhappy. Um, and I have done little tweak trims the, the entire, she's been here almost two months now. Um, and each time I feel like I've left her toe longer and taken more heel and she's happier that way. So I'm listening to her. I, I put her on sure foot pads to see where she tends to load her foot and how she is leaning when she's standing on those pads and what the impression on the pad looks like. Uh, I don't try to force an ideal on her. And I feel pretty passionate about that. Um, I know that that's different for other people, but that's something that I've seen help to increase comfort quicker. And I see that comfortable horses move more and horses that are moving more grow healthier feet faster. <laughs> um, so again, you know, I'm not one to force change in a hoof. If you're looking for that, I'm not your girl. I think of hoof care as a conversation. So I see how the hoof and the movement of that horse responds with each appoint appointment or with each trim and how that, how it looks the next time I go to that foot. So some horses prefer a slower timeline. Um, and you know, that's, that's okay. So this is a thoroughbred here. Um, this, these hooves were some of the most difficult that I've worked on, um, when it comes to rehabbing thoroughbred feet, I will say this was one year difference. And I, I, took this picture or, or did this comparison because he had much healthier hoof wall. He wasn't, you know, getting the chronic event lines, his alignment was better, but he wasn't fully comfortable in this picture either. Um, and it, it's still taken time to get him more comfortable, but this is a year, you know, so it's, you can't just say like, oh, well that thoroughbred we just saw on the last slide took a month. Um, some of them, you, you kind of got to unravel a lot of those the long-term issues they've been dealing with. So this is another off the track thoroughbred I work on. He was another one who was, came up comfortable fairly quickly. And the only reason that I met him was because he could not hold a shoe and his owner was fed up from him losing shoes, like within a week of his appointment and his walls were just super weak and literally breaking off. You can see right here, like he, he just had nothing to hold a shoe to. Um, and I met him and I was like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I can make, make miracles happen with these feet, but the owner changed his diet. She added a high copper and zinc mineral balanced supplement. And within just a few months, his healthier wall was growing down. I wish I had his radiographs on hand, but he, he almost, I think he like he got such thicker soles. I want to say double, but I don't want to lie. Um, I'm not sure how much, they, but he, he can now comfortably walk over all terrain. I mean, he has two club feet. Like he should not be comfortable with the fact that he typically clump footed horses have thinner soles. And, um, yeah, he's just, he's cruising around. So common roadblocks that I see for horses in their hoof rehab, um, diet, like we talked about, you know, treating horse or treating a thoroughbred like a stereotypical hard keeper and, and loading them up with higher starch or higher sugar than what they need and, or just not realizing that they might need more minerals. Um, one thing I will say is that a lot of thoroughbreds do tend to have pedal osteitis or a, a history of kind of bone, a coffin bone inflammation and coffin bone loss. And 
and cough and bone remodeling. I do think that that chronic concussion of racing might play a role in that. I can't say for sure. Um, and just because they have that, it, some horses with pedal osteitis have a really hard time of growing thick soles. That does not mean that these horses can't have healthy feet or can't be comfortable. And I think this also plays into that stereotype of, oh, my horse can't have healthy feet because it has pedal osteitis or, oh, my horse can't have healthy feet because it has this bone remodeling. Um, I've seen plenty of thoroughbreds that have, I don't know, 15, 20% of their coffin bone looks like it's, you know, gone or like their coffin bone looks like Swiss cheese and they're comfortable. Um, I think that Paige Poss has theorized that the density of the sole is more important than the thickness of the sole. So I, I wouldn't rule them out just because of that. Um, a lot of thoroughbreds are high low, um, meaning that one of their hooves is um, at a more upright angle and the other hoof is at a lower angle. Typically, I would say a lot of horses tend to have their right front, I'm making sure I've got this right, uh, more upright if they're going to have be high low. Um, this is usually a handedness in a lot of cases that I see, or in thoroughbreds, it can be their grazing posture from when they're young. Um, if they have one foot that's way stretched out in front of them, that foot tends to be their lower foot and the foot that's under their center of mass, under their body tends to be their more upright foot. Um, and once they're past a certain age, like if they start doing that when they're young, once they're past a certain age, their coffin bone has remodeled to the shape, you know, their coffin bone is remodeled in such a way where their hoof is going to follow that shape and you'll never have two matching feet. I think that almost every thoroughbred I work on has some varying degree of high, low and almost every thoroughbred I work on is fully sound, comfortable, moving over various terrain, able to handle the job that their owner wants to put them in. So I wouldn't rule them out because of that too, but it does take some consideration. I don't try to force the feet to match. Um, I don't, you know, obsess about the fact that they're high, low and, and say, and kind of, again, give them that, um, you know, limitation in my own mind. Um, we just have them try to grow the healthiest hooves that they can have given what their internal structures are. So I mentioned these as common roadblocks just because I know that others will say, oh, well, my thoroughbred can't have good feet because, and I want to kind of nip those in the bud. Like, yes, these can be, can be common issues, but it doesn't mean that they can't be comfortable and sound or have strong, healthy feet. So here's a compilation of pictures. Um, I don't uh, have all of the history on these images. I asked uh, some hoof care provider friends to submit some photos. And if people are on here that have submitted photos, um, I used a bunch that I thought were great. If I used every single one, this webinar would be 800, mile, uh, 800 hours long and you'd all hate me. Um, but there's some really awesome progress photos. Um, the first few are just ones from my own books. <laughs> actually, I trimmed this horse today and added this image in here because I was like, oh, wow, he actually is much less bullnose than he was last summer. Um, so this horse uh, was, this wasn't even his first, I wish I took a picture of this hoof the first day I met him. I met him in July of last year and I did not take a picture of this hind hoof. This is a very NPA hind um, and he had been very sore on this foot. And now he has much better angles on his hind. And I just thought I'd add that because I thought that was really cool to see those changes. Um, this is an example of a high, low thoroughbred that I see, um, still high, low. <laughs> so she has her upright right front and her, she had a low left front. She was overdue as you can tell in this picture. Um, but it did take some time even to get to this level of, uh, health. So you know, this foot is still upright. It's still more clubby, but it's much more evenly matched and she's sound, she's comfortable. Um, again, these are horses on, on my book. So this one is a thoroughbred that had these chronic, you know, kind of uh, CD toe, white line disease type separation at his toe, grew out in mm, what, six months, um, just with some diet change, adding some minerals, keeping that outer hoof wall off the ground and allowing him to grow in a healthier foot. 
This is uh, an off-the-track thoroughbred that I added these images. I know this foot, well, it's hard to see because of how dark it is, but this foot is not 100% healthy. But the reason that I added these images is because this horse is like over 30 years old. I think he's 30, 31. And I, ha I met him, this was actually a little while after I met him and, you know, this foot here was even better from the first time I met him. I didn't even take pictures. So I was like, oh, he's, he's like 28 years old or whatever. And I'm never going to get his feet healthier. Why do I even take pictures? And then as his foot started to get healthier, I'm like, oh, I should take pictures. <laughs> so, um, you know, I took this, this image when he had actually already improved a bit, but now he, he canters around in this turnout and super comfortable and happy at like 30 something years old. So we can't also use the excuse of, oh, I have a thoroughbred and he's 30 something years old or like 20 something years old. So his feet can never get better. Feet want to improve if we give them the chance. Um, so here are some other really cool uh, transformation pictures. Um, this one is Jacqueline Belknap. She's in Southern Virginia. Um, some really cool, I think this is only a few months. I think this is like six months, maybe again, thoroughbred off the track, just getting a, a healthier, you can see that here's white line separation, um, or hoof wall separation. And this to me looks like when you get, get that color to the soul, that to me is just like a really unhealthy, unhappy soul and just a much healthier soul and, and connection over here. I'm pretty sure this is the same horse. So again, one of Jacqueline's clients or or maybe her own horse i should look back at at that um this left one is an uh an, a thoroughbred trimmed by jody jensen again just a huge improvement in the alignment and, and looks like a huge improvement in the plantar angle here whereas these hooves were really bull nosed and bruised you can see and then just a lot happier and healthier um anna drabble i am so sorry to anyone watching if i pronounce your name wrong <laughs> um, but these ones are really cool. You can see that this hoof, I mean, this looks to me like it would probably be like a prolapsed frog over here. I mean, this looks like the heel is up here and the frog is down there. And this is just a crushed, sad heel. Um, and she's just got a much healthier foot under that horse now. Um, this is Anna on Facebook, Anna KT. I'm not sure if that's her last name, but Anna's equine trimming and training is her Facebook page. Um, and again, a really cool image of, of just giving the feet a chance to, to grow in healthier, better heel angles. Um, this bruising is gone. Still some event lines, but again, it takes time for these. So I, I swear every new hoof capsule growth, we get a healthier foot coming in. And this is another one of Anna's cases that you can see the alignment change. Here we have a broken back alignment and then getting a little better and then a much healthier alignment here. So again, these are all off the track or all thoroughbreds at least. Um, Kara Hobson from Rallyback Hook Care. <clears throat> um, again, these feet, I, like I said, I usually see that right front is a more upright foot and the left front's usually a lower foot. Um, so same horse again, this foot, just so much healthier, just so much healthier, just given the horse, the feet a fighting chance. And this one, um, Jillian Cornette matrix hoof podiatry, and just a few months difference of growing out these, this flaring and, um, poor wall quality. So again, there's so many more examples that I could have added in. Um, if you did, if you're really curious and want to see examples, I would join, uh, one of the hoof Facebook pages and ask people to post their progress photos of their bread feet. I'm sure you'll get so many really cool images. I just grabbed a few there. Um, but don't be scared to try. I mean, just give them the good diet, good movement and, um, give them a fighting chance. I have been so surprised time and again, of what thoroughbreds can do if you let them just you know, if you give them a little bit and then they, they maximize what you give them and, and kind of give you it right back to you. So, um, if you want to learn more on how to grow a healthy hoof, I do have the humble hoof podcast. Um, it's available on any podcast app. So I hope that that helps some of you figure out some of the things you can try in your horses. Thanks very much, Alicia. We have a ton of comments. Um, 
all very positive. Yeah. Uh, and we do have a couple of questions coming in as well. So if you guys have questions for Alicia, drop them in the comments, either on Facebook um, or in the Q&A here in Zoom, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, and I may throw in a couple of my own as well as a thoroughbred owner. Yeah. Uh, but our first question is from Callie Norton. Um, is there a difference in tissues of stratum externum and stratum medium that would explain why an otherwise healthy barefoot horse tends to peel in pasture board? So there is. So I don't know the exact biology behind it, but the stratum medium is supposedly a little bit, it's supposed to be a little bit more fluid or as what it was described to me as the inner hoof wall is supposed to be a little bit more fluid, pliable, flexible. That's why the stratum, stratum externum or outer hoof wall is a firmer protective outer wall. Um, when I see chronic issues with the outer hoof wall, I do assume it's a copper and zinc issue. But there has been some study and research into chronic cycles of wet and dry. So like a horse that's like out in the wet and then it's, you know, anyway, going through wet and dry cycles where there might be dry days and then drought days kind of thing can really kind of disrupt the connection of that stratum externum or outer hoof wall. Um, but I, if I have a horse that's on a good diet, I see that way less. I, I see, rarely see issues with the outer hoof wall. Sometimes those horses do need topical treatment as you're growing in a healthier foot or a lot of the time. So if you're seeing chronic issues with the outer hoof wall, especially if it has a separation between that inner and outer hoof wall, um, I would do something like an Oxine AH soak or clean tracks or white lightning or the, the name brands of that, um, just to make sure you're killing any microbes that might be causing issue. Um, from Anne, I may have missed it, but what is the expected daily intake of iron and copper in parts per million for an average size slash weight horse? So um, parts per million would be like 2.2 milligrams a pound is, is basically the conversion. I usually like to do milligrams. Um, so for like a, a thousand pound horse, I the NRC recommendation is 150 milligrams of copper, 450 milligrams of zinc a day. So that's in a three to one ratio of zinc to copper. Iron is around the same as zinc. So iron would be like 400, 450 milligrams of zinc a day is what's required for survival for like a thousand pound horse. Um, the problem is that most hay will provide upwards of a thousand milligrams a day of iron. And that can lead to a it has, it can have an effect on the absorption of the copper and zinc. So what I typically do if a horse is having hoof issues and I want to make sure I am addressing the hoof issues, I'll do a ratio of four to one to three for iron to copper to zinc. So if a horse is getting like a thousand milligrams a day of iron, um, then I'll do, you know, 250 milligrams a day of copper in their diet and 750 milligrams a day of zinc in their diet to make sure that they're absorbing a good amount. Um, the safe upper limits of copper and zinc are like in the thousands, like for a thousand pound horse, a safe upper limit would be like 3000 milligrams a day. You would never feed anywhere near that. If you're being careful, there's, you know, you wouldn't get that from grain and you're not going to get them from any supplement that, um, it's it's hard to find a supplement that even gives you hundreds of milligrams a day. So um, you're pretty safe there. Okay, good to know. Um, here's a question I can answer. Is this being recorded? Yes. <laughs> um, we will have this available on demand on our YouTube as well as in the RRP's educational library. Um, and I believe as soon as we sh shut this off tonight, you'll be able to rewatch it on Facebook as well. So uh, yes, definitely can serve as a, a resource going forward. Um, here's a question from Haley. I caught the Vermont blend mentioned, but missed others that were mentioned, I think referring to the mineral balancers. Any additional or other recommendations? Yeah, so you definitely want to look a little bit into your area, like is it high in selenium or low in selenium? Does your area need manganese? Things like that, because that can help you parse out what might be good for your region. But ones that are really great, um, like we said, Vermont Blend, uh, California Trace Plus. The Plus has a lot more copper and zinc, plus it has all the limiting amino acids. So I usually recommend the Plus over the regular for California Trace. Um, Mad Barn has Amino Trace Plus, which is really, really good if you're having hoof issues. Again, I'm recommending ones for hoof issues, so they're going to have higher levels of copper and zinc. There are other great supplements that might have a little less. Um, 
Horse Tech has Arizona Copper Complete. It has Colorado Mix. They have Lone Star Trace. They have a lot of regional mi mixes through Horse Tech. I would just double check the label to make sure it has the copper and zinc that you want. Um, oh gosh, what else? There's there's a, a bunch of them, and I'm, now I'm like blanking now that I'm on the spot. But I, you know, I'm not affiliated with any brand. I will just recommend whatever your horse will eat. I would recommend getting a sample from the companies. Some of them send them for free. Some of them send, you know, for just a couple bucks, you can get a sample and try your horse with it and see if they will eat it. Um, if you're in the UK, I like Forage Plus. I like Progressive Earth. Although right now I don't think anybody is awake in the UK. Um, <laughs> if you're in Australia, Carol Layton. Um, makes really good mixes out there. Um, here's a question um, on the Zoom, which actually was very similar to the question I was going to make sure um, we asked. So uh, what are your thoughts on mechanical support, such as a hoof, hoof boots or plastic glue on shoes while rehabbing? Um, and I'll add to this question a little bit because I know a lot of our makeover trainers, uh, they're on a fairly limited timeline for getting a horse ready to go to the makeover in October. Um, you know, and there's only obviously so much you can do in a short amount of time. So what are some of these other, you know, mechanical supports that we can use to help horses along? Yeah, I actually utilize hoof boots a lot with rehab cases. If they're not being ridden, I really like plow boots. They're really great for turnout. Um, I have a, a foundered horse in right now that's basically living in cloud boots with just like an hour break a day. Um, I do use glue on shoes for a handful of cases. For those that are listening and wondering, I'm a hoof care provider that has, you know, like 95% of my practice is barefoot and 5% is in composite glue on shoeing, maybe even less now because as their feet get healthier, we tra usually transition out of the composite shoes. Um, and I, I, think that there's so many options out there that are really great. It does depend on your horse's hoof, um, especially for hoof shape, what they can withstand in terms of holding their feet up for what options you choose if you're going with glue-ons. Um, some of them have weight bearing options, meaning you can keep the foot on the ground for the entire time that the glue is setting. Um, some horses that I work on are unwilling or unable physically to hold their foot up for the necessary couple of minutes needed to, for the glue to set, especially in colder weather. Um, but I use them. I think, you know, any kind of hoof protection has a time and place and I'm going to want to, you know, set the foot up for success the best way I can with my trim, have the owner set the foot up for success the best way they can with their diet and their movement. And then, you know, getting them comfortable. I kind of leave that up to you what your hoof care provider thinks in terms of applying things to their feet. I just tend to, to focus on hoof boots the most and glue on shoes as needed. I do think that they're, they're really great tools. Okay. Um, here's a question from Anne. Uh, have you seen any effects of confirmation on hoof health? Uh, one of her horses toes out significantly on its left front. Uh, so when it comes to confirmation, there's not much you can do past a certain age. Like, you know, typically within the first few months of life, you can do a lot with trimming to affect their confirmation. But after that, trying to change anything with trimming can actually be detrimental to their soundness and can mess with their joints and then in turn mess with their ligaments up the limb. So I actually am not too worried about confirmational faults or issues as long as the hoof is being trimmed to that, like, you know, being trimmed for the leg it's on and, and for the internal structures in that hoof. And I see horses that are super comfortable and sound when you do that. Um, I see more issues when we try to start messing with things. So I have horses that have, you know, long sloping pasterns and they, you know, it's, it's harder to get them to get straight alignment or to get their, their toe back or to get their foot under them. And they're totally sound if I work within their limitations or I have horses that severely toe out or severely toe in. And if you're working within their limitations and ba balancing their hoof wear patterns, which you can see a lot easier when barefoot, obviously, but you know, a horse that toes in will most often really wear the lateral side of their foot. A horse that toes out will really most often wear overwear the medial side of their foot. And if you kind of bring them into balance or even have an owner that's willing to kind of touch them up weekly and, and work on that, I, I don't typically see issues in, in soundness or it affecting their soundness. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to throw in my own question. Um, so this time of year is very muddy, <laughs> probably in many places around uh, the U.S. where our listeners are. Um, what, we didn't talk, I think, a lot about like environmental conditions for hoof health. So what do you recommend for people like me who are just stuck in the mud for the next month or so in spring? Yeah, I would say, so this might not help you this season, but I see horses on a good copper and zinc, or a good mineral balanced diet can withstand a lot of less than ideal environmental conditions. Um, in 2015, I visited England and horses in England, some of the ones I saw were living in mud up to like their knee and ones that were on a good diet. They didn't have any thrush. They didn't have any wall issues. They didn't have any white line issues and they were comfortable moving out over harder terrain once coming out of the mud. Um, so I think that diet can really, really help kind of, uh, build a, a barrier against that, those environmental issues. But again, diet can take, you know, seven to nine months for you to see the benefits of it, a diet change. Um, I love, I really like a product called hoof armor. Um, it is a Kevlar based epoxy. I, again, I'm not affiliated with, with it. I don't make any money from it. Um, but you know, I, I put that on a lot of horses that I see that live in not the best conditions to kind of add a little barrier. It can typically stay on for a couple of weeks, depending on how it's applied. Um, when it is applied, you do need a dry area to apply it when you're doing it. So you can't have a horse that like lives out 24 seven with no firm standing <laughs> and do it well. Um, but I will say that, you know, making sure that you're picking out their feet regularly, checking on their feet, um, you know, just basic horse ownership and hoof care stuff in terms of making sure that, that the area they're living in might be muddy, but not like, like manure and urine dirty, um, can actually cause more issue than just mud. So just basic horse cleanliness as best you can, and then good diet and management. I do like a farmer. I've been using that some myself. Yeah. My guys. Also not sponsored or affiliated. Just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, all right. We have a couple of questions, uh, back to feeding. So what do you suggest feeding to combat inflammation? That's a big wide question. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I laugh because people that know me, oh my gosh, I'm going to sound cruel. I'm kind of like, I, I don't love anti-inflammatories. So when it comes to like feeding something to combat inflammation, my way to combat inflammation is to remove inflammatory things. <laughs> so I want to reduce as much, for, especially for horses with hoof issues. I should preface that horses that are having hoof issues or hoof sensitivity. My first assumption is that there is, pro there might be a sugar and starch issue. So I want to remove as much, as much excess sugar and starch as possible. Um, some horses are incredibly sensitive to alfalfa, even though it's low in sugar and starch. And I know that a lot of thoroughbred owners love alfalfa because of the gut benefits, but if that horse is sensitive to it, it's not getting any benefits. So I have some horses that become foot sore or get inflammation in their hooves, which I see hoof sensitivity as an inflammation in the hoof. Um, just on a few bites of alfalfa. Um, I, I've seen some horses that get, uh, that become sensitive on, um, on flax, which sounds crazy because it's typically known as something that's really good for omega threes. And that's less common, but I've seen horses that become sensitive on soy. There's so many different things that can cause inflammation in an individual horse. And I compare it to a person, you know, everybody has their own sensitivities. Um, if I eat a lot of sugar, I get headaches <laughs> and I, you know, can feel it in my joints and especially in my lower back when I'm, you know, trimming all day. Um, and I think that that's true for our horses too. When they're eating something that's not serving them well, they can feel it all over their body and their hoof is where they're bearing all their weight. So they're going to see sensitive, you're going to see sensitivity there when they're eating something that's not, not working well for them. So my, my approach is more of an elimination style diet, as opposed to let me add more supplements or let me add something that's going to combat inflammation. Um, I'd rather remove sources of infl inflammation, if that makes sense. So in that kind of scenario, just to add a follow-up to that, how long does it take to sort of work that elimination out? You know, cause like typically, like, especially for horses just in that transition off the track, 
the prevailing wisdom is like, yes, put alfalfa in front of them for sure, because that's going to help you, you know, not only with the gut, but also adds a good amount of protein and helps them bulk back up again, you know, because they can kind of roller coaster a little bit weight wise in that transition. So if you turns out you have a horse that's sensitive to something like alfalfa, how fast can you figure that out through elimination? Yeah. So it's really tough because if you're taking a horse off the track, they probably have a lot of things that they're kind of like working out of their system and kind of, you know, the whole letdown process. So I would say it's a hard time to work out individual sensitivities because working out individual sensitivities is usually when you have a really solid, like this horse has been on a good diet program for a while and I'm going to remove one thing, like I'm going to just remove the alfalfa. And then you should see a difference within a few weeks. But if they're, if they're coming off the track and they're kind of, you know, their feet have been track feet on high start diets for however many years, and you, you might need months to grow out a healthier hoof connection before you can start parsing through individual issues. Um, I will say that if I've been working on a horse for a while and it seems like they have had a good diet on board for a while. And I, you know, I think alfalfa is awesome for some horses and I have some horses that do better on alfalfa than off alfalfa. So I'm not anti alfalfa. Um, but if I have a horse that has been on, had a good diet on board for a while and still has soreness or sensitivity over different surfaces, I'll tell the owner, okay, why don't you just try removing the alfalfa? And if the next time I come back, they're not feeling any better then it probably wasn't that. Um, but it can be hard to tell when you have weak feet already, if that makes sense. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be hard if they're, if they're just off the track and you're trying to figure things out, but typically if it's been a while and you're still not seeing the improvement that you want, that's when you can kind of parse things out. It should, it honestly should be a few weeks. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's one of the challenges with hooves, you know, and especially like, you know, at the RRP, I know, you know, a sizable chunk of people watching this tonight are probably going to the makeover, but then there's a lot of other people watching that are just trying to help their thoroughbreds in general, but feet are such a long game <laughs> for yeah. in terms of time, you know, when, if you're prepping for the makeover, you're working on that 10 month window, which, you know, this is looking potentially a lot longer than that to really grow a good foot. So yeah, really interesting. A um, couple more viewer questions. Um, do you ever supplement manganese? What role does it play in hoof health? Um, so my area is crazy high in manganese. In fact, the town that I lived in, I just moved out of, um, we used to get a letter in the mail every single year saying, um, like a no boil order saying like, you can't even cook with our water because it's too high in manganese and it's not safe to use. So I never... <laughs> <laughs> like supplement anything with manganese because I know the horses are getting or horses were in my last town where I was getting tons of it so I personally haven't um used it a lot it uh it is it's a necessary mineral um but the reason that I tend to stray from it is that it um competes with copper and zinc, zinc absorption like iron does and the hay test so if you test your hay when you're balancing copper and zinc you balance it either to iron or to manganese, whichever is higher, um, because that those both uh, compete for copper and zinc absorption. The only difference is you don't always see manganese in excess, whereas you almost always see iron in excess. So there are times when you do have to supplement manganese, um, but there's rarely, if ever, a time that you need to supplement iron. I would say actually there's it's very likely there's not a time when you need to supplement iron unless your horse has massive blood loss. Um, so I'm not the best one to answer that question about the manganese just because I've never had to supplement it. And so I haven't looked into it as much. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. This is the last question we have. So this is also last call for questions. Um, is there a time and place for hoof conditioners and is there any point in using them? If we're talking about hoof conditioners, like the stuff you paint on the outside of the hoof wall, I personally am not a fan. I find that most of them are lacking in like good ingredients. A lot of them have some kind of drying agent like um, alcohol or, or things like that that are in the ingredients and excessively drying the hoof, even if it's supposed to be a conditioner. 
Um, a lot of them can have some drying agent that can actually cause micro fissures in the hoof and cause more susceptibility to bacteria. Um, that's like at the worst, but at best, I feel like you're just kind of like painting a pretty varnish on the foot. That's not really doing much. There are some that are thrush treatments that have come out in the same kind of can, um, like hoof doctor, which is also, you know, in some countries it's called hoof doctor in the States. It's now called equine one. That's actually a thrush treatment and it's really good. Um, you don't typically paint it on the outside of the wall though. You typically paint it on the frog and the sole, um, where you'd see more microbial issues. Um, pure sole also makes an oil that's a thrush treatment. Um, but other than that, I don't, I don't really see a need for conditioners. I think that the, the moisture level of the hoof is grown. Um, again, a lot of it comes from diet horses that are in really severe drought conditions. I typically, you know, I've heard, I don't live in a drought area, but I've heard that if you, you know, let your water trough overflow once a week and let them step in it, that's plenty enough for, you know, access to moisture for the hooves. But otherwise I try to do that through diet. Okay. Uh, we had one more come in on Zoom from Kenzie. Um, advice for severe pedal osteitis with subsolar abscessing rehab that just came off the track. Nutrition adjusted in hoof boots on stall rest, very uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah. So that can be really tough because it's like inflammation uh, of the coffin bone or like inflammation of the tissue around the coffin bone. Um, and subsolar abscessing is super uncomfortable. And honestly, in those cases, the padding of like, if you're like, so for example, if somebody's using cloud boot, I really like cloud boots. If somebody's using cloud boot, some horses cannot tolerate the pressure of the pad in that cloud boot, um, it, with their body weight. And so sometimes you have to play around with like either cutting relief out of the pad. And this sounds like the total opposite of what you want to be doing. Um, but some horses it's like, they need, they can't handle any pressure on their soles, especially if they like have a subsolar abscess. Um, and again, you know, relieving as much pressure as possible. And it's going to be different for every horse trialing different pads, um, trialing, cutting out that like solar shape on the pad so that maybe the, the very outer rim of the sole is supported, but it's not putting pressure on any area that might be having abscess issues. Um, I'd probably, if there's subsolar abscessing, um, gosh, I don't want to give the wrong advice. Um, I have one here that had a subsolar abscess and, you know, I did an oxine age. So I was doing oxine age. So it's once a week and adjusting padding in their boots. Um, but that it takes time for sure. Um, but I will say that I've had horses with pedal osteitis that I've put into glue on setups that I've had to figure out. I will, I will say a lot of times those horses don't tend to like, like the flex lights or Versa lights, um, from easy care for whatever reason. Um, it tends to be like, not the right pressure. I don't know if the wide web is just like too much over their, their solar area, but I have done, um, like Epona style gluons, um, after any abscessing is done. I don't like horses in gluons when they're abscessing because, that can be a whole nightmare <laughs> for getting it to drain. Um, but yeah, I feel like that's almost like an individual case thing, but it sounds like you're doing all the right things in terms of diet adjustment and boots and, you know, trying to work out how to get them most comfortable. Um, time is a big thing too, you know, giving them the time to grow in healthier feet. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the toughest part with feet is the time. So um, I, I, I'm getting the impression of like a lot of, you know, a lot of us choose to <laughs> tackle major hoof issues after the makeover, you know, like if they need shoes or this or that to get through the makeover and then post makeover, you know, when we've, we've done the big show, then we have more time to, you know, kind of do a hoof overhaul. So, yeah, um, yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, I think we have... <laughs> 
<laughs> maybe overstate our welcome with Alicia. I don't want to wear you out, but thank you so much for uh, donating the, the time to speak with everybody tonight um, and everybody in the Retired Resource Project audience. So uh, if you guys enjoyed this, we have all of our other webinars um, from past years uh, are all on our YouTube channel. You can also find that in the RRP's free education library at the rrp.org. Uh, we also have plenty of long form written articles there as well. So you can dive right in and explore your favorite topics and, you know, get your thoroughbreds feeling and performing their best. So Alicia, thanks very much. Of course. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody have a lovely evening.